Lord, that you would give up heaven for us. The one who holds the universe together would come and live and walk among us and die on a cross for the sins of the world. Lord, there's no other love like yours. There's no other sacrifice as precious. Father, that you would give your only son for us. We thank you, Lord. Morning, everybody. <laughs> Good morning, morning. Happy Independence Day to everybody. How's everybody doing out there? Great, fantastic, awesome. Hi, Gretchen. How are you today? <laughs> it's funny, she doesn't like to be embarrassed, but yeah, she'll get up here and do the announcements. And she'll wear different colors, you know. I'm still waiting for the turkey outfit. I'm still waiting for that. 
Oh, you like to control the embarrassment. Oh, I see. I understand. <laughs> we are glad that you're here today. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to, to give a little, a little history about the country. 245 years ago today, 245 years ago, Larry was there. He remembers. <laughs> He was in the room. He was. He was really young, but he was in the room. Yeah, you and Fred, both of you. Yeah. <laughs> but 245 years ago today, a group of men got together and decided that they wanted to form their own country. And they signed the Declaration of Independence. When they signed that Declaration of Independence, they were basically doing treason. They were committing treason to England. They were signing their life away on that. They were signing everything away. When they put their name on that Declaration of Independence, they were then marked for death. The courage that it took for them to do that is just amazing. I wish we had men and women today who were just as courageous, who would sign their name, knowing full well that when you sign on that dotted line that your life is in danger. This country was founded on those principles. If you read the Declaration of Independence, I... I challenge you to read it. We have a copy of it in the back. Miss Cindy is standing right by it. Read it on your way out and look at what it says. It says that the people are the, are the ones who govern. The people choose who governs this country. And I'm, I'm sad to say that our ruling class has forgotten who's in control of this country. It's not them. We are the ones who put them in power. They're supposed to be working for us. Correct? They are. They've forgotten that we're the ones in control. So, from my perspective, 4th of July is, is a remembrance of our independence. When we said to England, hey, we don't want to be there anymore. We're going to do our own thing. And they knew that there was going to be a war and a revolution. And they did it anyway. So, remember that today as you're celebrating. However you want to celebrate, cooking some hot dogs and hamburgers, smoking some meat, whatever. Um, just be thankful for that. Be thankful that there was people back then who had the foreknowledge to say, you know what, let's go ahead and do this, and let's go ahead and sacrifice our lives for it. Let's all stand this morning. We'll begin singing Star Spangled Banner. <clears throat> oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the song is one of my most favorite songs, America the Beautiful. <clears throat> Love this song. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain, for purple mountains, majesties above the fruited plain. America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea oh beautiful for heroes proved in liberating strife who more than 
and self their country loved and mercy more than life america america may god thy gold refine till all success be nobleness and every gain divine thank you may be seated it's your turn fourth this is my favorite holiday because you get all the best things food fun family freedom fireworks they're all less <laughs> um, but you don't have to buy gifts and um, do that whole awkward oh you shouldn't have <laughs> when you get something you don't know what it is so this is uh, one of my favorite holidays for sure and the Star Spangled Banner is um, you guys all have a shower song I know you do or a car song what you feel like you sound amazing at <laughs> in the room with really good acoustics and then outside of it, it sounds like a dying cat. So <laughs> that's me and the Star Spangled Banner. I love singing it, um, but I usually only sing it to myself <laughs> and when no one's around. <laughs> but you guys did amazing, so good job. Um, we actually don't have that many announcements. This is gonna be a very low key week for us. Um, there's a lot of vacations going on. Um, we just finished VBS, uh, five-week VBS for our kids on Wednesday nights. So actually, we're going to take a break, a two-week break, and give our volunteers a couple weeks off. Um, there will be no services at all, adults or children um, or youth, um, this Wednesday. And then um, next Wednesday, the adults will come back, but we'll give the, the youth workers and the um, kid workers one more week off so that's in there we're gonna have a ministry break have a good week get some rest refresh the Lord talks about rest in the Bible and um, we want to be resting in him and um, make sure that we um, are the most effective that we can be and we can't do that we burn ourselves out so um, it is a, a break week for our ministry um, also please be in prayer though because ministry is not stopping being done we still have all of our normal stuff going on in regards to food distribution and um, the, the ladies who do knitting and then our prayer on Tuesday and there's a lot of things still going on it's just our regular service will be canceled for Wednesday um, and please be in prayer for our teenagers and all of the adults going with them because they are going to teen camp this week um, they leave at three in the morning <laughs> I think <laughs> so um, just enough time to take a short nap after the fireworks and come back and um, get ready to go to camp so please be with them I think they're gonna gather tonight at 11 um, and just make sure they're on campus it's a lot easier to leave instead of trying to get everyone and wake up parents and everyone come by 2 30 3 o'clock in the morning so um, please be in prayer for them for their safety there and back um, for the Lord to work in hearts and lives of everyone involved be with those that are putting on the program because if you have been to global youth camp with us they have amazing drama team and music team and and the pastor spends a lot of time um, delving into um, the Word of God so just um, please bathe our youth group and everyone going to camp in prayer this week and I think that's it because that's it yeah happy fourth <laughs> <laughs> thank you Gretchen I remember going to Glary and I were talking about uh, going to summer camp because the kids are going to summer camp in the morning we were talking about going to summer camp, and I told him, I said, it was, it was a rite of passage going to summer camp when the church van would break down. And it would happen a lot. It would. I mean, it seemed to happen more than not. But I'm thankful. I'm, th I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just, I'm thankful that the kids today um, have devices that they can keep themselves occupied with when they're, when they're broken down. I didn't have that. We counted all the we counted all the cars that were going by us. You know, we did whatever we could to pass that time. But pray for them. Pray for the church van. Pray for everybody going. Um, it's it's a life -chang changing experience when kids go to camp and they open themselves up to God and they can make life changing uh, decisions while they're there. So please pray for them uh, while they're gone um, and pray for the van that it, it'll drive good up and back. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I know, I know. 
I think I'm going to move. I'm going to move. <laughs> oh, my goodness. No, it's going to be fine. It's going to be great. I never said any, any of this. Let's delete that. Let's just move on. Let's all stand. We'll continue singing. <laughs> my country, tis of thee. <laughs> my country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside, let freedom ring. Our fathers, God, to the author of liberty, to thee we sing. Long may our land be bright with freedom's holy light. Protect us by thy might, great God, our King. Let's pray this morning. Lord, I thank you so much for the country that we have, Lord. Our country is the best country in the world, Lord, and I'm just so thankful for the country and the men and women who came before us, who sacrificed, who gave their ultimate sacrifice, their lives for us, so that we can be here today, worshiping you freely. Lord, I just thank you so much for that. I pray that you'd help us never to forget that. I pray that you'd be with the pastor now as he comes and brings the message today. Lord, I pray that you would fill him with your power. Lord, give him the words to speak. Uh, Lord, help us to listen um, with open ears for what you would have for us today, Lord, and change our lives. Thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. May be seated. Amen. Well, just so you all know that um, and understand. Wow. <laughs> Spiderweb. <laughs> Uh, our, we have much better vans today than we once did. Uh, by the way, kids, you're, you're good. In fact, we're, we're going to be taking the van that um, uh, Big Cypress uh, New Testament Baptist Church gave us from, down from the Seminole Reservation, and it's, gonna be, it's in great shape. And uh, uh, our old van um, is going to be retired. Um, I had it at the shop because the fuel gauge doesn't work, and, and I said, well, can we just kind of figure that out? And, and uh, our mechanic said, uh, no, you don't need to take this van out of state. <laughs> and he's right, so it's going to turn into a work truck or something around here unless you guys want to buy an old van. Um, got a lot of miles, got a lot of memories, and uh, it, it never broke down on us, but things happened, usually on mission trips. So, All right, if you will, turn in your Bibles to Psalm 119, pretty much the middle of your Bible. This is the longest chapter in the Bible. I'm going to preach the whole thing. We'll be here all the time. No, <laughs> no listen, um, you know, we've just finished up, Mark, um, going through a gospel is an amazing thing, and now I just feel like it's time we get down to some basics. So we're going to go back to basics, and today's basic is scripture. You know, um, we're celebrating 4th of July, the freedoms and all the things that, are, that go along with this. It's a great country. Um, I know that, that, that sometimes we're, we're a little concerned about the paths that, that our country's taking. And uh, if God's people would get back to some basics, I think there could be a turn in this country. So let me, before we really get started, I'll just read eight verses. You'll notice that uh, Psalm 119, verse 1, the first word there is Aleph. little instruction here. Aleph is the first letter of the Hebrew um, alphabet. When I took Hebrew in college, the uh, professor goes, turn to Aleph. And only because I had seen that in there, I knew where to go. Because um, I always wondered what it was. I didn't know what it was, and I was well informed after that. Let's start at Aleph, Psalm 119.1. Blessed are the undefiled in the way, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies, and that seek him with a whole heart. They also do no inequity. They walk in his ways. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. 
Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. I will praise thee with uprightness of heart when I shall have learned thy righteous judgments. I will keep thy statutes. O oh, forsake me not utterly. By the way, all of Psalm 119 has to do with Scripture. Did you notice all the words that, 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 that the Scripture is called here? It's the law of the Lord. It's his testimonies. Um, it's his ways, it's his precepts, it's his statutes, it's his commandments, it's his righteous judgments. You see, the word of God is what we base every single thing that we do on. And the farther we get away from the word of God, the more messed up we're going to get. Now, some of you out there go, well, how do you know it's the word of God? Well, because the preacher told me. No, let me give you just some things to think about, because people are going to ask you all the time, well, how do you know that the Bible's true? How can you trust the Bible? Let me give you some facts, and we'll do a little bit of teaching before we get into the preaching part of this. The Bible consists of 66 books, over 40 authors wrote it, and over a period of time of 1,600 years, and it has the same theme from beginning to end. Um, there was a lady named Jessica Miller. She wrote in uh, uh, Christianity.com a little things about the Bible. By the way, um, Jesus said that his, heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will not. Matthew 24, 35. 2,000 years, multiple people have tried to discredit and get rid of God's word, and they have not been able to do it. The Bible is the best-selling, most widely distributed book of all time. Yet, we still have skeptics. They don't quite believe it. They think the historical accounts are wrong. They tend to question everything. Well, let's look at some evidence. First of all, well, let's just look at, the, the Bible itself claims to be Scripture. 2 Timothy 3.16 um, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is proper for, for uh, doctrine, for reproof, for correction, instruction in righteousness. And I missed a few of those and it goes back to getting an F in doctrines for not memorizing my verse properly. Not only did I have to memorize, I had to spell it right. I don't spell well. Thank goodness for spell checks today. I don't even spell well enough for spell check tech over. The Bible itself, though, claims to be God's Word, and it is. And if that's not enough, let's just talk about manuscripts. You guys know what a manuscript is? Okay, manuscript is a piece, of, if you don't, it's a piece of uh, Scripture. It's uh, written, most of them are handwritten, and uh, there are abundance and a high quality of manuscripts av available to compare. Um <laughs> The more copies of a, a, a scripture is the is uh, the more copies, the more uh, evidence that it's true. Um, the higher the confidence and the reliability. Um, let me see how I can get this all put together because there's a there's something that is missing here. Oh, it's paid on the back. This thing printed both sides. I guess I'm saving paper. I thought it should have been thicker. Okay. Um, we have more than a thousand times the manuscripts data for the New Testament than we do for the average Greco-Roman author. Not only this, but the existing or extant manuscripts of the average classical author are no more than 500 years after the time he wrote it. The earliest surviving copies of the New Testament are mere decades from the time they were written. The New Testament has 5,856 complete or fragmented Greek manuscripts, 18,130 manuscripts from in other languages, and most ancient books don't have any of that. How many of you all are familiar with the Iliad? few hands go up, or the Odyssey. It's made by Homer, right? Yeah, the, 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 the closest manuscripts, there's only like three or four, and they're 500 years after all of this happened, yet nobody questions that. Yet we have thousands of manuscripts 
and early manuscripts. God has preserved his word as he promised to do. Scholars estimate that textual criticism has been able to restore the New Testament to 99.5% similarity with the originals. Dead Sea Scrolls added more confidence about the reliability of the manuscripts. Listen, all the, 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 all the people, all these experts, they will, the evidence is just overwhelming that we can trust in our Bible. The historical evidence, the same message from beginning to end, even though there's multiple eyewitness testimonies, even though there's multiple um, authors, all go back to this one theme, the redemption of man at the cost of Jesus Christ. There's extra biblical confirmation. Bible archaeology <laughs> tends to prove the Bible over and over. Our science doesn't quite get it sometimes. In fact, I'll, I'll give you some more of those things. Um, genuine a belief in the appearance of, of Jesus. Uh, people saw Jesus. Hundreds of people saw him. Fulfilled prophecy. Let me give you some. Oh, let me. How are you guys? How are you uh, with numbers? Are you good with numbers? No. Okay. Let's look at some numbers here. There's a guy named Peter Stoner and Robert New, uh, Newman. They wrote a book called title, uh, entitled Science Speaks, and it was based on the probability. You guys, how many of you are gamblers? Nobody? Nobody that will admit it? <laughs> okay. So you understand prob probability. Okay, let's look at this. <laughs> the probability that Jesus of Nazareth could fulfill eight prophecies that are written in the Old Testament, and he did fulfill all of those prophecies. <clears throat> Look at these numbers. One in uh, 10 to the 17th power. You know, that's like, oh man, I can't even. Here's what that looks like, because I can't imagine a number like that. Let's cover the state of Texas two feet deep in silver dollars. Been to, have you, yeah, that's a lot of money, isn't it? Two feet deep, and Texas is kind of big. Have you ever been to Texas? I've only driven about halfway, and it was long enough. It's big. Okay, so they're there. Two feet deep, silver dollars everywhere. Then let's take a blindfolded man heading out of Dallas on foot in any direction, and, and he's going to pick up a silver dollar that has a red spot on it. That's the probability of what Jesus did. Yet it happened. He goes on. Interesting observation. He points out <clears throat> that his copy of Young's General Astronomy, that was the science book of 1898, is full of errors. But the Bible written 2,000 years ago is devoid of that scientific era. For example, the shape of the earth is mentioned in Isaiah 40, 22. Gravity can be found in Job 26, 7. Ecclesiastes 1, 6 mentions astro, um, astro, astrophomonic, atmospheric circulation. Oh, man. A reference to ocean currents can be found in Psalm 8, 8 in the hydraulic cycle, which is described in Ecclesiastes 1, 7 and Isaiah 55, 10. The second law of thermodynamics is outlined in Psalm 102, 25 to 27 and Romans 8, 21. The second section of Stoner's uh, book is entitled Prophetic Accuracy. And that's where the book becomes absolutely fascinating. One by one, he takes major Bible prophecies concerning cities and nations and calculates the odds of their being fulfilled. The first is a prophecy in Ezekiel 26 concerning the city of Tyre. Seven prophecies are contained in this chapter, which was written in 590 B.C. Nebuchadnezzar will conquer the city. Other nations will assist Nebuchadnezzar. The city will be made a bare rock. It will become a place of spreading fishing nets. Its stones and timbers will be thrown into the sea. Other cities will fear greatly the fall of Tyre. The old city of Tyre will never be rebuilt. Four years after this prophecy was given, Nebuchadnezzar laid siege to Tyre. The siege lasted 13 years. 
when the city, city finally fell in 573 B.C., it was discovered that everything of value had been moved to a nearby island. 241 years later, Alexander the Great arrived. Fearing the fleet of Tyre might be used against his homeland, he decided to take the island, where the city had been moved to. He accomplished his goal by building a causeway from the mainland to the island, and he did that by using all the building materials from the ruins of the old city. Neighboring cities were so frightened by Alexander's conquest that they immediately opened their gates to him. Ever since that time, Tyre has remained in ruins and is a place where fishermen spread their nets. Thus, every detail of the prophecy was fulfilled exactly as predicted. Stoner calculated the odds of such prophecy being fulfilled by a chance as being 1 in 75 million, or 1 in 7.5 times 10 to the 7th power. Okay, those are just a couple of these things. And it happens over and over and over again. And God's word is true. Isn't that nice to know? This is, so now, just giving you a little bit of evidence. Does that give you some confidence that you can trust your Bible? I hope so. Because, see, that's the basics. That's the thing that our faith is built upon. Because we wouldn't know anything about Jesus. We wouldn't know anything about anything if we didn't have the Bible, correct? And you know it's not real reliable when I, like, I can tell my daughter something, and by the time it gets to my wife, go tell your mom this. By the time it gets there, it's changed. Y'all ever experienced that? Yeah. So we're back. Psalm 119. It's written as an acrostic on the Hebrew alphabet. You'll see all those little Hebrew letters in there. That's what that is. The Word of God is mentioned 171 times. Well, 171 out of 176 verses. It's referred to law, testimonies, ways, statutes, commandments, righteous judgments, word, and ordinances. So what do we do with all this scripture, this one huge passage? I'm not going to read it all this morning. We'll be here forever. Let me just give you a few hits on this, and then we'll get into the meat of this. The scripture, God's word, the Bible reveals God to us. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Psalm 119.1. Psalm 119.12 Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. The psalmist David is, tr is asking God to show him and to teach him. We go to the, the New Testament, Gospel of John, starts this way. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. You see, the Bible reveals God to us as the creator. We see that in Genesis. We see that in, in, in Psalm in 119, verses 73 and 90. In Genesis chapter 1, and John 1, in Colossians 1. It reveals God to us as the righteous one. The one who is perfect. It reveals God as a judge. Wow. I want you to just think about that for just a minute. Our God is righteous. He's perfect. And he is also a judge. So he has to judge things by righteousness, by per perfection. We're in trouble at that point. But he's also the merciful one. He's the one who loves. He's the source of salvation. He is the faithful one, the unchanging one, the one who is good, and the one who is near. Psalm 119, verse 151 says this, Thou art near, O God, and thy commandments are truth. You see, without the Bible, we would never know who God is. And by the way, if you want to know who God is, get into the Scripture, because it will reveal him to you. It will reveal his mercy. It will reveal his love, his grace, also his righteousness and his judgments. It will reveal that he's good. Scripture also reveals us to us. I'm not real good about this one. I don't care for this because 
I don't like to look at myself too hard, but the Bible does this. Psalm 119, 176, I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek thy servant, for I do not forget thy commandments. God's word, it convicts, it cleanses, it quickens, it strengthens, it establishes, defends, comforts, instructs. It enlights us, it assures us, it upholds us, it delivers us, it frees us, it teaches us, corrects us, it gives us hope, it gives us wisdom, understanding, and peace, and it just keeps going and going and going. God's word revealed to me that I had needs, that I was broken, that I needed help. God's word also revealed to me that there was one who loved me, who wants to help me, and wants to heal those brokenness. His name's Jesus. God's word helps me each day. I learn wisdom. I, I've become a better man from reading God's word. I handle things better. I, you know, it's been said that every single thing we need is in God's word. And all it does, all, it, all we need to do is get into God's Word. Scripture also reveals we have an enemy. enemy. Psalm 119, 161. Princes have persecuted me without a cause, but my heart standeth in awe of thy word. 1 Peter 1, 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Listen, please be in prayer for us this week. Peace be, we need more prayer than ever, uh, uh, ever today. Not just today, in the t these times today. In, in a few weeks, you're going to hear a message on prayer because that's one of the basics. But let me tell you something. We have enemies out there who are against us. And, 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 and as God's people start to to cling to him and to to reach out to him satan doesn't like that he's real just as god's real let me tell you i'll make it real simple satan wants to keep you from coming to know the truth and receiving jesus christ as your savior being saved that is his that is the very <clears throat> heart of what satan wants to do in this world but if you do come to know Christ, he wants to destroy your, your testimony. He wants to destroy your character. He wants to destroy you and make you unusable for the, for the kingdom of God. Because, see, if we're doing things right, we're going to be sharing that wonderful blessing of being forgiven with others so they can be forgiven. And he wants to stop at that. See, we got a powerful enemy, but we have a more powerful God. Scripture also reveals eternity to us. Psalm 119, verse 175. Let my soul live, and it shall praise thee. Let thy judgments help me. Revelation chapter 21. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. A little bit later in that chapter, we get a description of this. And he carried, uh, starting at Revelation 21.10, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain. And he showed me the, the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven of God, having the glory of God. And her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, and the twelve gates at the twelve at the gates, twelve angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. And on the east three gates, and on the north three gates, and on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof, and the wall thereof. And the city lieth four square, and the length is as large as the breadth, and measured the um, city with the reed 12,000 furlongs. The length and the breadth of the height are equal. And then he measured the wall in 144 cubits according to the measure of a man, that is, of the angel. 
and the building of the wall of it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold like unto clear glass, and the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third uh, caladoni, uh, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardis, the seventh crystallite, the eighth barrel, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysosphorus, the eleventh jasper, the twelfth amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were, transparent glass. I can't get my mind around that, can you? But this is what's been preparing for us, what Jesus is preparing for us to live in. So much better than here, right? We hold tight here, but look at, he's got, it tells us of eternity, of how we can be in eternity. It tells us of the great place that God has prepared for us. It also warns us. Revelation 21, 27, and there shall be no wise enter into anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. You see, to get into that place, you have to be perfect because it's a perfect place. That reveals another side of eternity, one we don't like to talk about. It's called hell. In Luke chapter 16, we have the story of a, a very rich man, and he fared sumptuously every day. And then there was a beggar named Lazarus who laid at his gate and who was full of sores, and he, he was fed by the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. And dogs came and licked his sores, and it came to pass that the beggar died, and the air, angels carried him into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou, that in thy lifetime, receivedest the good things, and likewise Lazarus the evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Beside all of this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us. That would come from thence. And he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, the word of God, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Matthew 25, verse 41 says, Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Revelation chapter 20 talks about a great judgment. And I saw the dead and small great stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up her dead and were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. We have the two contrasts. We have hell, which is an eternal place that God has revealed to us. It's a place he does not want us to go. It's not a place he had prepared for us. It's a place prepared for the, the devil and his angels. And we have heaven a glorious place that he has prepared for us. It comes down to this, though. What do you put your faith in? 
Some people try to put their faith into good works or good things or, or being good or doing good or <clears throat> but they all fall short. It's interesting that the, the rich man wanted Lazarus to go back and see his brothers and, and, and Abraham in that passage said that, that they won't believe him. Yeah, we have Jesus Christ who has risen from the dead and so many do not believe him. Jesus came to this earth. He was perfect, sinless. He lived and he died on a cross. He was buried and he rose the third day. The Bible says if you will believe in him, if you will believe in that, that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again for the forgiveness of sins, that you could be forgiven. That means God will never bring up anything you ever did or anything bad that you've ever did. He also won't bring up anything bad that you're liable to do. See, it's forgiven. It's never going to be brought up again because Jesus was perfect. He paid the price that we can't pay. So we get to spend eternity in a glorious place called heaven. Now, those of you who want to try to do it on your own, without that grace, without that, that mercy that God gives through Jesus Christ, you're going to have to pay it on your own. My plea to you, if you're here this morning and you never reached out and believed on Jesus, called on him to be your Savior, ask him to forgive you and to be your Savior, that you don't leave this place before you do that. You see, it's not popular to preach. It's popular to preach heaven, but it's not popular to preach hell. But if there's a heaven, there's got to be a hell. And I don't want you to go there. This church doesn't want people to go there. That's why all the things that we do are geared to get the message to people so that they can make the choice. They can have the truth of God's word revealed to them that they may escape a horrible eternity, and may enjoy a great eternity. All that being said, here's what we need to do. We must build our lives upon Scripture. This is the very, very basic thing. We have got to build our lives on Scripture. How do you do that? Number one, we do that by reading and meditating on the Scripture. Psalm 119, one, uh, verse 15. I will meditate in thy precepts and have respect unto thy ways. Verse 148. Mine eyes prevent the night watches that I may meditate in thy word. Psalm 119.9. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. With my whole heart I have sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hidden my heart that I might not sin against thee. Joshua 1.8, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Philippians 4.8, finally, brethren, Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are holy, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Okay, let's go through meditation a little bit this morning. There's a lot of things out there on meditation. There's a lot of things on Eastern meditation, and we don't want to do Eastern meditation. That's Buddhist in nature, it comes from Buddhism, and it comes from, it's from Hinduism, um, which is more gods than you can imagine, and the whole, the whole purpose of Buddhism and is to get to a place where you become nothing. <laughs> I don't want to be nothing. I want to live in, in, in heaven forever. When we talk about meditating in God's word or on God's word, it means we're thinking about God's word. It means we're memorizing God's word. Now listen, I kind of sometimes have to paraphrase because I can't get that right. I don't always get it just right. Okay? I killed a lot of brain cells in my youth. Okay? 
just, you know, we don't have to go too far there, but just, I promise you, I, I'm amazed that I'm even alive today. But meditate on God's Word. Read God's Word. It starts by reading. You can't, you can't meditate on something until you read it, right? And we live in such a great time. If you struggle reading, you can, you can get a little app on your phone, and it'll read it to you. In all sorts of different versions. There is no excuse for someone today not to be able to get into God's Word. There are a few places that God's Word is not in the native language. We don't have that problem here in, in America. We need to be in God's Word. We need to read His Word. You need to do it every day. You may need to do it several times a day. And then you need to, what you read, you need to think about. Listen, we think about a lot of crazy stuff. We get a lot of stimuli from all over this world, from all over this culture, through media, through, through look, we, we, we're bombarded with stuff. We're bombarded with so much stuff, we don't know what's true and what's not true. So why don't we go back to something we can always count on as being true? That's why Philippians 4.8, listen to this description of what we're to be thinking about, to meditate on. Things that are honest, things that are just, things that are pure, things that are lovely, things that are of good report, things that have virtue, things that have praise. Those are the things that we are to think about. Those are the things that we are to saturate our minds with. And the only place you find that is in God's Word. Joshua, as he's getting ready to go into the Holy Land and lead a million crazy Israelites, stubborn and, and, and says, Joshua, don't be afraid. He says, meditate therein. The book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. Meditate therein day and night. Thou mayest subdue according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. You want to have a prosperous life, a successful life? Meditate on God's Word. By the way, God defines success a lot different than, than we do in our culture. Just understand that. Joshua also says, Joshua, don't depart to the left or to the right. Just stay right there. Be balanced. We are to meditate. We are to read on God's Word. Secondly, if we're going to build our lives upon Scripture, it's not good enough just to read it. Not good enough just to meditate on it. You've got to obey it. That's where everybody, everybody, lo oh, I'll just love to go to a Bible study. I don't want to obey what I learn. I just want to go to the Bible study. Psalm 119, verse 2. Blessed are they that keep his commandments, or his testimonies, and that they seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. That was Jesus. Okay. I don't know how to phrase this other than just obey what you read okay just obey it i know <laughs> we're celebrating fourth of july we're, we're we're celebrating rebellion against england to have a great country right it fits right in as americans we are super rebellious by the way you really do need to understand that uh, i've been to the uk have you been, it's interesting in the UK, the mindset, to very much stay within their classes, and they don't know that they can get out. You get an American over there, what do you mean you're stuck here? I'm going to get out of this thing. I'm going to, I'm going to climb to the top. That's the American way, right? Yeah. I don't care who I have to climb over, who I have to put out what I have to do, I'm going to get mine. No, that's not how God says to do things. No, we're to obey his word. You want to have great success? 
meditate on his word and obey it. Obey it. The ends don't justify the means. Obey God's word. Be ye kind one to another. Let's start right there. Let's just be, start being kind to people. And by the way, we don't have to straighten everybody out. We just got to love them through God's word. God's the one that does the straightening out. I got to tell you, I, I was really rebellious as a, as a kid. Gretchen was talking about being 4th of July. Our 4th of July is we, we spend in Lake Placid at my grandmother's lake house, water skiing and doing all sorts of things and shooting rockets at each other. And, you know, <coughs> yeah, I took one one year I went to Inglewood Beach with three of the guys and we fished and we did all sorts of stuff there. But most of the time I was in Lake Placid and we were raising cane. Um, after dark, we went out and tried to find trouble in those days there wasn't much trouble to find in Lake Placid so there's a bit of rebellion in all of us and that rebellion comes back to sin we just don't want to obey God's word sometimes we think we know better sometimes it's just too uncomfortable sometimes we got to obey it start with the little things Love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, so I'm not going to go trying to straight out my, straighten out my neighbor um, the way I would straighten out one of my kids because I wouldn't want anybody talking to me like that. I'm not going to talk to some. I'm going to do my very best not to talk to someone in a way that would <clears throat> that I wouldn't want to be talked to. You ever notice that? Some people are going to talk to you, and the first thing you want to do is go fight them. I expect that from the lost people, but when, when believers do that, when they come in and they start after you and they're and you you're just the first thing you want to do is is punch them out. Oh, you you guys you you're laughing, but you've experienced that. That means we're not obeying God's commands, right? Proverbs says a soft answer turns away wrath. It tells us we are loved to our neighbors as ourselves. You don't want people talking to you that way, so why would you talk to them that way? Let's start with the simple things. Let's start in love by loving Jesus with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind. You see, when we're loving God with all of our heart, when we are loving others as ourselves, we can obey the next part of that, which is to go and make disciples. Right? I, I've had I've seen believers do this chew somebody up and down and then want to tell them about jesus <laughs> yeah right <laughs> they're really going to believe you since used to work at a bank in orange park and a pastor would come and make a deposit and he was just the meanest orneriest horrible customer cruel to the people and stuff what type of testimony was that for jesus and everybody knew he was a pastor what a thing that is We can't just read Scripture and meditate upon Scripture. If we're going to build our lives upon Scripture, we have to obey it. We start obeying Scripture. We can do some things. Psalm 119.16 says this, I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. Verse 127 says, Therefore I love thy commandments above gold, yea, above fine gold. When we learn to read and meditate on God's word and then obey what he has taught us in his word, we will have incredible success. God will use you in, 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 in miraculous ways to reach others that they might understand the truth and come to a, a knowledge of, of, of a Savior who will forgive them. An eternity with that Savior. Here again, if you're here this morning and you've met or made that choice to follow Jesus, to, 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 to 
receive him. Just a minute, we're going to have a, an invitation time. You still do that. We're a bit old-fashioned in that, and I don't care. And I know sometimes people say, well, all you ever do is preach salvation. Yes, because there may be one person. I didn't understand it the first time I heard it. <clears throat> first bunches of times I heard sal a salvation message. Yeah, it's always going to be in a message. Understand God's words are reliable, and it does tell us how we can be saved. And if you want to know that, in a little bit, we're going to have that time. Even after that time, we're going to be hanging around here for a little bit. If you have questions, <clears throat> come to me or, 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 or come to someone, and they'll take God's word, this word that we can trust so much, and they'll show you the truth of how you can make your home for eternity in heaven. If you have other needs. There's a lot of people suffering out there today. Um, that that you're su there's people in this room suffering. There's people who have been part of this church who have lost loved ones who are suffering. I think of the Dykeman family. Please keep them in prayer. There's others. If you have a need this morning, and you wanna want someone to pray with you, we're here to do that for you. In fact, why don't we go to prayer right now? Let's everyone stand up. let's pray. Bow our heads, close our eyes. Father, as we come to you this morning, we are thankful for living in this country, a country that gives us the freedom to preach your word boldly, Lord, to call sin, sin, and Lord, may we respond to you not in rebellion, but out of love. Thank you for your word. Thank you that you have revealed yourself in your word. Thank you that you have revealed who we are and our great need. Thank you that you revealed that we can have a wonderful eternity with you. Lord, I fear for those who don't come to know you. Father, may we read and meditate on your word. And Lord, may we obey the word. If there's someone here this morning who doesn't know you as Savior, I please ask that you will work in their hearts, that you will draw them to you. And that they will have the courage to ask someone to help them to know how heaven can be their home. Pray for others as we all struggle with different things. We struggle with that obedience to you. Lord, please empower us and help us. Help us to be a people that glorifies you, that obeys you. And we just give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing. I'm going to be right down up front here. If you need to pray or you need something, I'm here. I've wandered far away from God. Now I'm coming home. The Pass of sin too long I've trod. Lord, I'm coming home, coming home, coming home. coming home. Come
coming home, coming home, never more to roam. Open wide thine arms of love, Lord, I'm coming home. All right. Thank you all. Um, I made it to the back. Listen, have a great 4th of July. Uh, enjoy burgers, dogs, whatever you eat, and uh, rejoice. And please keep us in prayer as we're going to camp. It's going to be a great time. Thank you, and you're dismissed.